this is Corinne McDermott. I'm standing here outside of the Tattered Cover. This is Denver's large, independent, locally owned bookstore. Uh, it's a place where you can come to see local authors and other authors do book signings, uh, have a little Q&A session. And I've just been down to see uh, David Sirota, who's talking about his new book, The Uprising. Check it out. This book, I set out to ask a question. What is happening in this country? Why are people so angry? And what is this anger going to mean? Who is organizing this anger? What will it ultimately mean, if anything? And I sought out to I sought to ask that question and go report on the answers. And I sought to do that acknowledging my own personal politics. I, I am a progressive, uh, but I also sought to do that. Uh, sought to report and ask the question, acknowledge my own personal politics, but then report the answer. And what I found is that there is a lot of anger out there. You don't need me to tell you that. You can go talk to folks on the street, talk to your friends at work, talk to your family. People are very angry about what's going on in this country. Uh, people feel like the government no longer works for them, that the government, in fact, works when it does work. It works for moneyed interests. And that the government is not just playing a, a passive role in the crises we now face, the national security crisis, the housing crisis, the credit crisis, the job crisis, the outsourcing crisis. The government's not playing a passive, incompetent role. It's actually playing quite a competent role in helping create these crises. And I think what I found first and foremost is that people recognize this. Uh, and that we are in a moment, as I call it in the book, of an uprising. And I define uprising as that middle state between the interregnum periods of disengaged stasis and those momentary historic moments of social movements that have changed our country over the last 100 or 150 years. As one of the California Minutemen said to me, direct quote, I was watching TV and I decided I had to go try to do something. And, and what I found is that this anger is being organized on both the left and, as I inferenced with the Minutemen, on the right. And that we're being told right now that we're definitely in a democratic or progressive era or that we're moving into that era. And I don't think that that's necessarily the case. It's more likely to be the case, but it's not necessarily the case. The impulses on both the right and left of the people that I met with and reported on are very, very similar, if not almost exactly the same. The California Minutemen who are guarding that border will say to you that they are there because they think the government is bought off and that our immigration policy is a product of the government being bought off. And I agree with them. Now, I disagree with what they want to do. I disagree with their prescriptions. And similarly, I heard from the self-described communist union organizer in Seattle says the government is bought off and has helped create the wage crisis in this country that we are trying to organize to fight back against. The impulse on both the right and left at the rank and file level is the same. The professional political organizations in Washington, D.C. who purport to want to end the war and who raise a huge amount of money saying that they're going to end the war. And they have run a traditional uh, uh, inside the Beltway political campaign spending a lot of money on television ads, lobby, lobbying, with the idea that you can end a war with a traditional political campaign. And that, I think, that entire concept is, is absurd. There's two goals. You can either want to elect more Democrats and bash Republicans, or you can want to end the war. Those are separate goals. But that strategic corruption will end up, I think, and I think already has, ended up prolonging this war. It's an important lesson, I think, that as we live in this media environment that continues to tell us that the only thing that's important, the only way for you to make change, the only place that it's important to be engaged is in 
being engaged in any political endeavor that has something to do with Washington. That is an extra extraordinarily subversive message when you consider the sheer math of the situation. That is what the media tells you. Turn on CNN, presidential race. The only thing important is the presidential race. You read the, the Denver Post. You read the newspapers. The only thing that's important is the presidential race and the Senate race. The U.S. Senate race. It's like you don't have a legislature. It's like you don't have a city council person. And that is a really, really subversive, really, really uh, uh, negative message if this uprising really is going to become something. Because let's remember, every major uprising that became a social movement in our history started and was implemented away from Washington. Thirty states passed civil rights legislation before the Congress ever debated it. Grover Norquist, Phyllis Schlafly, name your conservative movement leader, started and continued to operate in state legislatures and city councils. I mean, this state is the example, right? Taylor. It's the trophy of the conservative uprising. The lost legacy of direct action that we have lost in the last, I think, 30 or 40 years. Direct action is the kind of action where we take matters into our own hands. Electoral action is where we work to elect people to do things on our behalf. Much of the history of this country is a history of direct action, even though most of the last 30 years the attention of the media has been on electoral action. We don't have a 40-hour work week and a weekend because some politician in our state legislature or, or the U.S. Capitol decided one day to pass a 40-hour work week. We have a 40-hour work week because workers at places like Mobile stood in front of mine and said, I'm willing to get shot unless the company starts respecting my rights. That's direct action. The people at Red Line, the union organizers today in Seattle, the shareholder activists, these are people who say, I don't care who the president is. I don't care who the congressman is. I don't care who the governor is. We're going to organize and we're going to do things on our own. And we have lost this legacy in this country. We have forgotten about this legacy. It is almost, in, in many ways, made fun of. Protesting is basically made fun of in the media. Unions are all made more than the media. Shareholder resolutions are covered only in the business press. But this is, I think, something that we have to revive. We are going to be told over and over and over again that the most important thing national, federal politics, but even more powerfully, that the only important thing is electoral politics. And if you think about how disempowering that is, electoral politics is the place that the establishment and the powers that be want us to focus our attention. It's the controlled place. It's the place with the rules. It's the place where things can't get too crazy. Right? And it's also disempowering. We have to go beg Mr. Congressman, please Mr. Congressman, Madam Congressman, please do something on our behalf. Please. They're disempowered when we lose sight of the fact that elections are merely one avenue of change. And that even within the electoral arena, the elections themselves are not change. This is the other thing we're being told. That <clears throat> candidates are social movements out of themselves. They're going to wake up the day after election day and change will have happened. Policy change will have happened. When in fact, the history of this country is both direct action and when change happens in the electoral arena, it happens because politicians are forced to accept it. People in power right now are trying to suppress that psychology. They are trying to say, do not vote on the movement Think only in partisan terms. Think only in electoral terms. And that, I think, out of anything, will prevent this uprising from becoming a social movement and actually making real change. That outcome will be either our achievement or our fault. There's no two ways about this. That 20 years from now, when we look back and we say, we did it or we didn't do it, it will be completely our achievement or completely our fault. And future generations will have the right to blame us, or the right to heroize us, as truly the greatest generation. 
That's how high the stakes are right now. This is Corinne McDermott outside the tattered cover here in Denver for the uptake.